In this video, we'll compute a bunch of limits using algebraic tricks. All of these limits are of the zero over zero indeterminate form kind. Recall that this means that the limits are of the form the limit of f of x over g of x, where the limit of f of x equals zero and the limit of g of x also equals zero. For our first example, let's look at the limit as x goes to one of x cubed minus one over x squared minus one. Notice that the numerator and the denominator are both going to zero as x goes to one. To calculate this limit, we want to simplify this expression. One way to simplify it is to factor it. So let's rewrite this as the limit as x goes to one of x minus one times x squared plus x plus one. We're factoring the numerator here as a difference of cubes. We can also factor the denominator as a difference of squares, x minus one times x plus one. Now, as long as x is not equal to one, we can cancel out these two factors of x minus one. And so the limit of this expression is just the same as the limit of this expression. Now we can just plug in one because plugging in one gives us a numerator of three and a denominator of two. And that way we've evaluated our limits. Next, let's look at the limit of five minus z quantity squared minus 25, all divided by z. Once again, when we plug in z equals zero in the numerator, we get zero. And in the denominator, we also get zero. This time, instead of factoring, the trick's gonna be to multiply out. So let's rewrite this limit as the limit as z goes to zero of 25 minus 10z plus z squared minus 25. I just distributed to get this expression divided by z. Since 25 minus 25 is zero, I just have the limit as z goes to zero of negative 10z plus z squared over z. Now what? Well, I could factor out the z here. As long as z is not zero, I can cancel here. So for my original limit is the same as this limit. Plugging in z equals zero, I just get negative 10 as my answer. This third example is also a situation where the numerator is going to zero and the denominator is also going to zero. In this case, I'm gonna to try to simplify the expression by adding together the fractions in the numerator. So I'll need a common denominator, which is r plus three times three. So rewriting, I get the limit of one over r plus three. I multiply that by three over three in order to get the appropriate common denominator, minus one third, which I have to multiply by r plus three over r plus three all that over r. Continuing to rewrite, I have in the numerator, adding together these fractions, which are, have the denominator of r plus three times three, I get three minus quantity r plus three, and then this entire fraction is still divided by r. Distributing the negative sign, I have three minus r minus three divided by r plus three times three, all divided by r. Three minus three is zero, so I can rewrite this as negative r over r plus three times three, and now instead of dividing by r, which is r over one, 
I can multiply by the reciprocal, 1 over r. r divided by r is 1, so this expression simplifies to negative 1 over r plus 3 times 3. So finally, I'm in a pos good position, because now I can just go ahead and let r go to 0, and by plugging in r equals 0, I have a limit of negative 1 over 0 plus 3 times 3, or negative 1 ninth. This example is a little tricky because it involves square roots, which can be hard to deal with. But there's one nice trick for dealing with square roots that works here, which is the conjugate. So I'm going to take the expression that we're given and multiply by the conjugate of the numerator in this case, because the numerator is the place where the square root is. By the conjugate of a minus b, I just mean a plus b. The conjugate of a plus b is a minus b. Well, of course, if I multiply on the numerator by something, I also have to multiply the denominator by the same thing so that I won't alter the value of the expression. So this limit here is equal to the limit of the expression down here that looks more complicated, but in a moment, if we're lucky, things will clear up and become simpler. So multiplying the numerators across, I get the square root of x plus 3 squared. I get plus 2 times the square root of x plus 3 minus 2 times the square root of x plus 3, minus 4. On the denominator, I get x times the square root of x plus 3, plus 2x, minus the square root of x plus 3, minus 2. Now let's see what simplifies here. So the square root of x plus 3 squared is just x plus 3. Ah, and I see that this expression and this expression are opposite, so they subtract to 0 here. So on the numerator, I just have x plus 3, and then I still have the minus 4. On the denominator, the denominator looks a little messy. I'll just copy it over for now. Okay, so on my numerator, I'm getting x minus 1. Notice that when x goes to 1, that numerator is still going to 0. And in fact, as I let x go to 1, that denominator, if I plug in here, everything's going to also cancel out to 0. So I still got a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. But maybe I can use one of the previous tricks of factoring. Because look at here. If I factor an x out of these two expressions, uh, sorry, a square root of x plus 3 out of these two expressions, and I could maybe factor a 2 out of these two, factoring by grouping. Let's try that. So we have x, square root of x plus 3, times x minus 1 from these two expressions, and then I have a plus 2 times x minus 1 from these two expressions. This is looking promising. So now I've got an x minus 1 on the top, and if I factor out the x minus 1 from each of these two expressions, I'm going to have an x minus 1 on the bottom times the square root of x plus 3 plus 2. Now, for x values near 1 but not equal to 1, I can cancel those, and my limit simplifies to just 1 over square root of x plus 3 plus 2. Plugging in 1, I get a 1 on the numerator and square root of 4, which is 2 plus 2, 4 on the denominator, and we have calculated this limit. Last example here, another 0 over 0 indeterminate form. Now 
anytime I see an absolute value, I'm going to want to take cases because the absolute value of x plus 5 naturally falls into cases. If x plus 5 is greater than 0, in other words, x is greater than negative 5, then the absolute value of this positive number is just itself. On the other hand, if x plus 5 is less than 0, in other words, x is less than negative 5, then the absolute value of a negative number is its opposite. And we make the expression x plus 5, turn it into its opposite by putting a negative sign in front. Now let's look at one-sided limits. As x goes to negative 5 from the left, we have a situation where x is less than negative 5, this situation right here. And so we can rewrite the absolute value by taking the negative of the expression. We still have a 0 over 0 indeterminate form, but if we use the old factoring trick, factor out a 2, and cancel, we get the limit of 2 over negative 1, which is just negative 2. If we do the same exercise on the right side, when we're on the right, then x is greater than negative 5, so we're in this situation here, when we can just replace the absolute value with the stuff inside. And again, factoring the numerator and canceling the x plus 5, we just get a limit of 2. So we have a left limit and a right limit that are different. And so in this example, the limit does not exist. So we've seen five different kinds of limits, all of the 0 over 0 indeterminate form. And we've used five different methods to evaluate them. For the first example, we used factoring. For the second example, we did the opposite of factoring. We multiplied out. For the third example, we added together our rational expressions to simplify things. The next example, we use the old multiply by the conjugate trick. And the last example, we used cases and looked at one-sided limits.